Hello everyone. The City of Coquitlam would like to begin by acknowledging with respect and gratitude today that we are hosting this event on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples and the home of the Coquitlam First Nations. We are very fortunate to live and work on this beautiful land of fresh water, forests and mountains. Welcome to the City of Coquitlam's Recreation Facility Innovation Lecture Series. This is part two, sports facilities. The City of Coquitlam is planning more than a dozen major recreation and cultural facilities in the next 10 to 15 years. And in July of 2020, the city began development of a new major recreation and cultural facilities roadmap. This roadmap is a user-friendly document that distills the very complex process of funding, designing, construction, and operating of facility projects. In planning for these works, we are hosting this event and this lecture series in order to capture opportunities for innovative ideas for a number of new and renewed facilities. And in particular, for ideas about how to design inclusive buildings and what are emerging trends in recreational facilities. My name is Nerida Eco. I work for the city of Coquitlam and on my team, I have Tina Mack. She is the Recreation and Cultural Facility Planning Manager. And I also have Conrad Boychuk. Conrad is a external consultant and he is a IKS board member and he'll be heavily helping uh, lead the discussion today. We have two registered sign interpreters with us today. Uh, to pin these ASL videos, you can click the three dots on the upper right corner of their video and select the pin option. Providing that you have the latest version of Zoom, you can pin videos of both sign language interpreters. In addition, we have Dennis Sandstrom and Liz Stokelman from the consulting firm HDR, and they're here to provide IT support for us today. And if you have any questions during the lecture that you'd like to pose to either the city staff or some of our panelists, you can enter it here anonymously and you can scan the QR code with your mobile device and it will link you to Slido. The link will also be posted in the group chat for your reference. So in case if you happen to not have the QR code on you, then you're welcome just to go type in those numbers and you can go right onto the site. If you like one of the post questions that you see on Slido, please hit the like button so we can prioritize it within our discussion. Today, we will hear from a panel of internationally practicing architects, planners, and designers to share their insights and experiences to help develop our roadmap. In addition to the benefits of the city, our team recognizes that sharing these conversations as public events can only benefit us, but other municipalities, and also foster industry best white practices and connections. I would now like to take the time to introduce our panelists for today, starting with Colleen McKenna, who is the Associate Director of Sports and Recreation and Wellness at Canon Design. Colleen, if you'd like to take it away. Good morning. Um, my name is Colleen McKenna, Principal at the firm, and I'm delighted to be here this morning sharing my thoughts. Um, my career has taken an interesting turn. I was a former competitive swimmer, so I combined that with my passion for architecture and put the two together and have been focused my entire career on uh, sports facility design. And I'm incredibly spoiled uh, to be doing what I do. I lead our national practice and I'm based in the Boston office. Next slide, a little bit about our firm. Uh, we're a large uh, international firm. Majority of our offices, we have 17 offices in the United States. Um, our sports group was established over 40 years ago. And since then, we've worked on over uh, 600 uh, projects across the country of various uh, sizes and, and scales. Next slide. Um, and part of our, uh, our work is not only on the competitive side, the sports, but also a large majority focused on, on recreation and the impact that it can have in, in so many communities, you'll see the Richmond Oval, um, which our firm com uh, completed years ago. And I was spoiled enough to live in Victoria for uh, five years. Next slide. 
So a few of the topics that I'm sure we'll be uh, speaking about today that we see is really driving uh, innovation on inclusivity and, and wellness and resiliency. And I'll just touch on each one of these uh, momentarily. So the next one. So inclusivity, incredibly important. We are a much more diverse country uh, than we were even five and 10 years ago. And being really thoughtful about um, that as part of our design process is, is something that's incredibly important. The next topic on wellness, uh, we've all lived through a, a very difficult year of COVID and wellness is front and center on everyone's mind. Um, and it's, it's more than just the exercise. Uh, and there's a lot that we'll be able to discuss today. So resiliency, um, unfortunately, many of us have, have dealt with natural disasters, whether it's earthquakes or tornadoes or storms that have really impacted um, our, our buildings and, and the location of them and how they serve our, uh, our communities. And the last topic, um, the future of hybrid. Um, we've seen some really interesting uh, technological advances as we've all been working from home and, and living and doing remotely. And I think there's, there's a lot of uh, life left in, in how this may inform our design moving forward. So the last slide, we're really excited about the future and where we go from here. And I think if anything, the last year is really um, taught us that we have a lot to learn and a lot more that we can uh, explore. Then it's my turn saying hello from Denmark. Hello, my name is Espen Danielsen. It's early evening here in uh, Denmark in the Northern Europe. Um, it's so nice uh, to be able to participate. Um, uh, I could um, take a long talk about uh, recreational spaces, uh, especially I have tried to focus on what are we doing in the biggest cities and what are the biggest trends for sports and activity areas. And here the answer in Denmark uh, right now is we are all going outdoor. And that was also before the corona disease, but uh, that has just speeded up that we want to be active and we want to be active together and we want to be active outdoor. Please change. Um, I am today um, Director of Culture in the city of Copenhagen, which is the capital of Denmark. Um, we have around 1.3 million citizens and Denmark is a little country with uh, uh, almost 6 million inhabitants all in all. And um, so my work is today to be in charge of how the city supports and also run uh, all the cultural sports uh, and outdoor facilities. That's basically the work goes from libraries to mountain bike trails, from swimming halls to uh, gyms uh, all over. Um, I have just started this job and have been part of uh, uh, the Danish Foundation for Culture and Sport, which is a quite special organization working in uh, gathering um, international trends and try to support architects and development of new facilities for culture and sport. So I work quite heavily with uh, uh, how to develop uh, and how to uh, look into trends for recreational life uh, and and especially interesting i think it is to combine the experience from sports and from culture uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of things which uh, work together and uh, and are combined in new trending uh, where people want to be more ad hoc uh, more just when they need to be there they want to have storytelling they want to be part of places which are special exactly where they are and that they, they can uh, take togetherness uh, can uh, be part in activities uh, in in communities uh, smaller bigger ones please change just a few examples so you can see what we are talking uh, from. In uh, the three uh, main cities of Denmark, uh, we have all uh, developed a uh, harbor bath. We have cleaned the water in the old industrial harbors with, which are placed in the middle of the cities. 
for historical reasons, the cities have grown um, uh, by the harbor. And now today we have this harbor bath where you can meet, you can bathe. This is from the city of Aarhus. Please change. Next one is from the city of Olbo. Uh, and please change again. And this is from the city of Copenhagen. In Copenhagen alone, there are four different harbor baths and we have thousands of people have their recreational life outdoor. You can be a, 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 a professional swimmer. You can go stand up paddling. You can canoe. You can just have fun and bathe together. You have safety areas where children can be. You have uh, lifeguards and so on. So this is a huge meeting point and, and the whole situation have now been all year. One of the newest and biggest trends in Denmark is winter bathing that we also want to bathe when it's quite cold, when there's snow and ice, and we are using these areas as well. And this is totally a new thing that we have dense cities where there's no space, but we go on water to be together, to be active. Um, and of course, I can understand if you are from a city where the harbor is not very clean of water, you are thinking, uh, are you insane up there in the Nordic countries? But we have for a long time worked with cleaning the water, with uh, having uh, sewers which are not going directly out in the water and dividing uh, uh, sailing and uh, other activities. So this is possible. This is just an example of new recreational spaces and how some trends are going uh, there. Um, please uh, change. Next slide. Um, this is another example. It's called Copenhill in uh, Copenhagen. This is a, a, a garbage facility. Uh, in, in Denmark, we gather garbage and we burn it because we have a, a whole system of getting electricity and heat out of uh, factories which burns garbage. We have a system where that is possible. And because we had so little space in the main cities, then we have to use what you do not expect, it could be a parking house, but here it's a factory burning garbage with where there is a hill on top. Maybe you know Denmark, there's no hills, so it's hard to uh, be skiing. This is an example where you can ski on top uh, of a factory building. Of course, you could say this is a very special idea, but it's opened up and it's a very, very huge meeting place. You can just run up. Every morning, people will go running and go to the top and look all over Copenhagen and run down again. They can be elderly people who walks in the afternoon, but you can also go there to, to have a professional skiing hill. Not so big, but still uh, alpine uh, skiing. Just to give you some inspiration and some examples, um, please uh, change the slide. This is an example of uh, one of the main squares in uh, Copenhagen. It's called Superkeelen which have been totally changed. So it's now an, an activity area in the middle uh, of the dense city where people are uh, living around. You have a school, you have a, a shops, and you have a lot of people living together. One of the huge metro stations, and you go up here and you will see this is uh, where it just was built, so it's not so many people in this picture, but normally it's full of people who are doing all kinds of sports. And you can have organized sports being able to being in the part of the square, but you can also have uh, self-organized sports. It's basketball, it's football, it's handball, it's uh, physical training, it's yoga. All these things are happening, but in the same time, it's architectural, it's an arty space which are lifting the feeling of the city. And this is a place you just are going because it's so uh, in your face in the how it's done. And you are smiling when you're going there and you will see all kinds of people taking part. The biggest uh, uh, discussion is, of course, there are so many people that it gives some noise, it gives some extra activity. So, of course, it's not without problems to do activities outdoor in the city, but still, People are really looking forward to this. A little inspiration, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. That's all from me. Hello, my name is Harold Fuchs from Austria, Vienna. Good morning or good afternoon. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon or morning. 
I'm a specialist, I'm an architect, I'm a specialist in leisure and recreation activities, as well as school buildings. Uh, my career started about 30 years ago with a first stadium that I had to build in, in my early years of an architect and, and, and then the career started and, and another stadium came along and then I started with sports halls and now I can really say that I'm an expert and I'm a very passionate expert on sports halls. I'm, I'm leading the Sports Halls Experts Circle in the IX. I'm president of the IX Austria, and I'm a member of the UA Sport and Leisure Group. My team is a rather small one compared with, with, with other offices. We, we are only about uh, 10 to 12 people in, in the office, but we're a mixed office. We're an office of designers, architects, as well as sports, sports scientists, as well as sports technology equipment experts. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to show you some examples of our current work, uh, especially concentrating on sports halls. The first hall is a circular sports hall in Vienna. It's actually a renovation, a pilot project, uh, because there are six round circular round holes of that type in Vienna still left. They date from the 1970s. Uh, they had a very, very poor insulation from the beginning on. They had very poor qualities in, in the sports room. We won the competition because we not only did a new facade for the sports hall, we did a new facade, but we also did a new roof. We lifted the roof. We separated the main sports hall from the sports gallery. And our main goal in this uh, series of sports halls, it's six sports halls all, all together, is to improve the design of the sports halls and also uh, improve the pro programming of the sports hall. So we really concentrate on programming these sports halls on ball sports and program the gallery uh, just adjacent to the sports hall uh, to some other leisure and transport uh, activities. So next slide, please. This is your new sports halls we, uh, we did in Klagenfurt. It's actually three sports halls, as you can see. Uh, it's one of the first sports halls in Vienna we did uh, with heated sand. Uh, it's an archery hall and it's a big uh, four uh, four times uh, four court uh, volleyball hall with about 3000 spectators. The spectators facilities are mobile. You cannot see them in the picture because we, we, we move them away. We only need the spectator facilities three or four times a year. So as you can see in the middle, in the middle picture, uh, we use the area where normally the stands would be, we use them as a track and field, as an indoor track and field. So with this sports hall, we combined a track and field sports halls with a um, ball sports hall. Uh, it's a classical training hall as well as a spectator facility. Next slide, please. And, and the, the, the last slide I want to show you is uh, a new sports hall that is just being finished in Vienna. It's actually a 2000 square meter big uh, leisure and sports hall with the concept of an empty space. The empty space is built with a concrete wall, a wooden, a wooden ceiling, and, and the space in this hall can freely be changed uh, as, as the client wishes or as the, actually the city of Vienna wishes. On the pictures now you see some soccer courts, there are some, some volleyball, beach volleyball, <laughs> but there are also some other sports facilities within this big volume, the neutral volume with the neutral floor. Uh, the special thing about this is it's on the, on the area of a very old ice skating ring. The ice skating ring has been removed. There is another very old uh, ice hole, which we also renovated and we put on a new uh, Olympic court, uh, ice court just, just in front of this sports hall. And we use all the energy that the ice making machine makes 
to heat the new sports hall. The new sports hall does not need any any energy from outside. All the heating is is being is being done by by the heating that the ice making machine is making. There's actually a PV power plant on on the roof, so it's a extremely high efficient building that even uh, that even makes more energy that it actually uses. Thank you very much from this point from Vienna. All right. Um, we'll proceed now with a series of questions. And, and before we do, I, I wanted to give you my own perceptions in terms of um, sports halls. I've had the opportunity to be on the IKS jury for exemplary facilities on six different occasions. And the sports hall is always a, a key component of that. And what I've seen as, as a Canadian, as a North American, is that there's a fundamental difference in sports halls when you look at parts of Europe and North America. And, and even in Europe, uh, in, in the German speaking countries, for example, I find the, the purest and um, the, the most elegant of the sports halls, they are always focused around uh, a very sports oriented indoor field of play. And typically they're incredibly elegant boxes, although Harold's presentation showed that uh, in the 70s, certainly Austria got away from boxes and, and went into circles. When you look at Copenhagen the, 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 uh, or, the, or Denmark, <clears throat> the Danes are always pushing the envelope. So if you see a rectangular building in Denmark, there's a good chance these days that it doesn't quite go down to the ground and it I, it speaks to what um, Esben was saying, that there's a real passion for the outdoors. So when you go into um, a, a Danish facility, you never know what you're going to find inside. But when I am in one, I am well aware that sport isn't the important thing. It's people gathering and being active, but it's less structured from a programming perspective. When we head to the States, um, sports halls or gymnasiums, as we tend to call them in North America, um, tend to be grouped with another facility. They are part of a destination as, a, as opposed to being a, a fundamental core solo component. So in municipal facilities in the States, we will often see swimming pools as part of the partner. With the, um, with the gymnasium and in university facilities. And I think Colleen, you can speak to this a little bit. There are even other components that go along with the sports hall or gymnasium. Um, so I just wanted to provide that, that initial background and um, uh, speak to, uh, if you can, uh, okay, my, my, I have some basic questions here. Sorry, one of my computers just went off. To, to all three of you, what are the current trends and innovations in sports halls or multi-use uh, gymnasiums in terms of both the spaces and the programs that drive those changes? And Colleen, we'll start with you. Um, thanks, Conrad. Good, in good introduction. I, I, in the US, I think one of uh, the differences that we might see maybe perhaps in North America is that they do have a tendency to be highly specialized, um, as you're saying. So they're part, the, the sports hall or the gym is part of a larger um, project that has other program components. And some of the challenges that we run into is that when we are doing say a multi-purpose gym space is, is trying to have it do too much. And so we're very cognizant that um, it can almost become multi non-purpose so that you're trying to do so many things that you don't do anything well. And so what we're seeing now in terms of trends is um, a, a huge interest for indoor turf, uh, certainly. And that is that technology, that surface is so different from a synthetic or hardwood surface. And so in some cases now, we've seen like indoor turf that's retractable so that not unlike what you might see in a field house where you have a, a track that can be a bank track that, that's hydraulic. So that you can try to get a little bit more programmatic opportunities than, um, you know, than, than just perhaps a single purpose, which is uh, somewhat what we tend to do. The other thing is that the interest in, in MACs or what we call multi-purpose activity courts 
so that we have a, say a hockey dashboard system, but instead of being hockey, it's actually being used for indoor soccer or basketball or roller hockey or any numerous number of activities. So it gives you that flexibility as much as possible, but within some, some boundaries. Um, because we find that the purists for basketball want, want the hardwood floor systems. And when you try to introduce any other activities, there, te there tends to be some, some conflicts with that. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Oh, sorry, Esben. Your your comments on the question. Yeah, um, a bit alike. We have also the experience that the uh, um, these sports halls, which are very multifunctional, are not well functioning for anybody. So we have uh, shared spaces a lot, but uh, it's going in the way which sharing is the right sharing and there's not a standard for for a sports hall it's locally um, designed depending on which are the most uh, used activity situations locally but what we can say basically is we have changed uh, the trends are that we have changed from having the activity field in the center to having the town hall or the community space in the center and then have all the activity areas around. Also because um, the, the sports um, activities are changing much faster than beforehand. So it's not the same way you play tennis now that now you play it in another way. So you have to change the activity indoor or outdoor area. So you have a, often an indoor town hall situation where you can go outdoor for artificial soccer field, you can go indoor to tennis, you can go indoor to gymnastics. There's a lot in, uh, in new indoor gymnastics specialized, uh, um, and we have a lot of badminton and hand, handball in, in Denmark, and they are placed around and they can be basically be changed. So you all arrive in the same area and then you divide from there. Um, that's a new trend. And the new thing is that the outdoor spaces are not placed uh, aside, but closely up to the town hall. So outdoor and indoor are just, you can open up the end of a gym hall and then you have the outdoor space as well. Sometimes you also have a concert hall or a rehearsal room for music, a theater a stage as part of the activity area, depending on smaller, bigger cities and smaller cities to have it all together around one town hall. Thank you, yeah. uh, it's been Harold. Thank you, thank you very much, Conrad. So I think the trends are quite similar in, in Canada, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and also Denmark, of course. So uh, we really tend to skip our existing regulations. So we, we totally try to, to get away from the standards that, has, that have been established in the 70s or even earlier. So most of the sports halls that a normal architect now would build would be the same as in the 50s or 60s. That's what we at the moment totally skip. So we start to uh, remove equipment from, from the sports. We try to uh, make them more empty, uh, bring in transports, and above all, we always try to see the sports hall as part of a sports hall network. So we, we think that the programming, the individual sports hall is much, much more important in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the network of sports halls because there's not, not normally not only one sports hall. So we program the one sports hall on, on more gymnastics or an indoor gym and we program the other one for more a spectator facility and more a spectator driven uh, facility and not so much classic school sports. And with this, we're quite successful and we always have a participation process now at the beginning of these sports halls. So we try not only to ask the school, the teachers, we ask the, 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 the clubs, we, we ask the, 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 the whole environment around, around the sports. So what are their needs uh, for, for social rooms, but also for multi-sportive rooms and this works really quite well and we we find out that we can uh, shrink ball sports places we shrink them to th two thirds of of the common space and we we gain some social space that's what we learned from us so and this works 
So if we if we go through this participation process, we find out that also the clubs can deal with the fact that they don't have a classical uh, ball sport field. It's just smaller. While on the other hand, there's room for for some slack lining, for boulder, for for empty space, for dancing, for music, for for new uh, IT technology driven sports. And this is what is really fun, and 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 that is actually what I would say is a very very uh, big trend. Thank you, Harold. And I have seen that evolution when I first started looking at um, uh, sports halls in, especially in Switzerland, but in Germany and Austria as well. It it seemed that the the motivation behind the design was just to get into the building, immediately get to the dressing room, and straight to business. And, and now we've seen a significant uh, change uh, from that. And your, your last comment takes us into the, the next question, which has to do with public engagement. So a question to all three of you, how do you engage with the community to champion, <clears throat> excuse me, accessibility, inclusivity, uh, inclusivity and diverse participation, especially for those of lower incomes and indigenous or diverse communities and how do you make sure <clears throat> that you're reaching the whole community and from my perspective especially youth at risk and um, and I would say seniors at risk as well so Colleen we'll we'll start with you again um it's inclusivity is a, a, a is an excellent topic and um, as we, as I mentioned that we be, we've become a much more uh, diverse uh, nation and I think one of the challenges that um, having looked back on my career, and I'm, I guess I'm a little bit old enough to, to say this at this point, is that we had sports facilities where they were designed for the athletes and they were designed for, say, the fitness enthusiast. And we didn't really care about the couch potatoes and we didn't really care about the people that weren't in the buildings. And we only focused on speaking to people that wanted to be in the building. And so I sometimes call it the missing 10% and those that were left behind. And, and so designs evolved and there was a certain population that never went into these types of facilities and their voice wasn't heard. And so I think we're paying a lot more attention now to really reaching those that um, it's as much about asking people who do use it as asking people who don't use it. And what are their barriers to participation? And their barriers might be simply that they're not comfortable. That might be economic barriers. There might be social barriers. But what are those barriers? And breaking down those barriers helps define uh, the programs and services that could come out of it that would allow for a more um, a diverse population and a more welcome, welcomed building, I guess, that becomes part of the community. And, and, that's, and, and age is, is simple. Um, I, I don't want to overstate it, but yes, there's a lot of range uh, between an aging population and, and between those that are young. And there's certainly design characteristics and program spaces that address that. But I think what we're all so much more sensitive to now is going beyond that and understanding that um, there are certain things that we can do in terms of programs and services that then drive the design solution that are about reaching those communities and really going out and boots on the ground and talking to individuals, especially those that are not in your building and understanding why and what are those barriers and breaking down those barriers so that they can feel comfortable participating um, in your facility and are part of the design process. Right, and because your office does both municipal facilities and university facilities, student facilities. Mm -hmm. Does the same apply or are, do, do each of those topologies have a different approach or challenge in terms of inclusivity? I think it's, I think it's easier at the collegiate level because you, in one way you have a captured audience. They're, they're there and, and so you know who they are. And sometimes it's almost easier to, uh, to understand what that campus community looks like. I think it's harder um, in a public or civic facility where the reach is so much broader. And so there may be pockets of, of um, 
whether it's 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 age or diversity or whatever those those um, um, how you break down your community mem potential community membership and then really going out to them. I think it's it's a much more intentional process in a public facility um, because you have a much broader range on, on who could potentially be using it. And you wanna reach everyone as best you can. Thank you. Um, Esben, mm -hmm. same question to you, but before you answer, I, I remember as I walk Super Killen, uh, seeing the, the diversity of cultures and ages in, in that complex, I won't call it a facility, but that, initiative and complex. Uh, and I know when I, I believe the facility was the crystal or the prism in, in Copenhagen, uh, it was full of, of multi-generational, multicultural individuals. So what is what is the Danish approach to uh, trying to incorporate a very, very diverse population? Um, it's a huge question, Conrad, and, and I think there's a lot of answers. Uh, you have to divide. Uh, we are looking a lot into <clears throat> who are the, um, you call the, the, the potatoes, the, the not active potatoes, Colleen, that's a fun <laughs> expression. Um, we have, of course, the youngsters, for example, or the families in a bad social situation. It's much harder there. There we are working with small uh, recreational open program spaces close to where they are living. And then there's a huge thing of how to organize the place. Uh, you have to have hosting at the, at the place. Uh, so people are active meeting the families to invite them in and uh, to make them safe. Because if you see, have a signal of an active space to inactive people, you start in uh, below, uh, uh, it's a hard start at first because they are not safe there because it's a space where they normally do not behave well. Um, if you go a bit to people who are not so active, but are easily done, made active, I put up a picture here um, for a place called Streetmaker, which is an indoor facility taking in all the experience from street sports. So it's uh, taking in uh, skating, inline skates, uh, scooters, you know, these uh, 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 children's scooters, uh, uh, skateboarding, a street basket, uh, bouldering, as you can see here, um, all, con uh, all kinds of diverse activities, which are no not so heavily known from everybody, not have a huge long history, but then you make the space for hang around. So you have more than half of the space for people just being there because it's nice to be there just like the open air facility you saw before. Um, so you can just go in, see what happens. Uh, you can sit there, you can make your homework, you can be there with your friends. This is of course the more, more young, youngster facility. And then you are invited in to participate by hosts in easy activity, but you can also be invited in to more high level activities. So you have a broad range of uh, dynamics within the uh, activity field. We see more and more of this. This was just a street maker uh, example, but uh, it, it's also done for elderly people where you have like um, their normal meeting place with uh, uh, eating together, uh, having music, then you uh, invite in yoga spaces, uh, you invite in walking activities for routes in the uh, in the city and coming back to a meeting point, maybe you combine it with a museum. So you have a walking situation where you uh, are looking at the uh, arts or at architecture or uh, meeting up at the museum. So you you're quite shifting uh, the area, but whole, the whole time with the uh, focus of having people being more and more active. Uh, but I think the street maker is the best example we have. Uh, you, you mentioned Prisman, which is an alternative gym, which was the first starter with, with football and handball and so on. But uh, uh, we also hear uh, in Denmark, we have the teenagers are the uh, hardest uh, uh, target group to work with. They uh, go out of all the sports communities. They only train uh, individually if they are active at all. And the girls are uh, the mini, uh, the, um, which are 
less more or less active. And here the street uh, sport area has uh, really gone up in both uh, young girls and boys. So it's quite interesting example. It's new, it's within five years. So we have not so much uh, uh, sharing of knowledge, so much evaluation yet, uh, but uh, we can see the experience coming and we will work on much more with this. Uh, thank you, Esben. Uh, and Harold, you, you're associated, I think, with the most classic form of sports hall from a North American perspective. How, how do you um, engage the community as you, um, as you plan these things? And you've already spoken a little bit about it, but uh, a little bit more depth. I think I think it's, it's it's just this participation process that we that we make and, and and with with all these talking seminars workshops with with all the the people living in the district we 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 uh, make more uh, more access to the sports facility so we really try to to open it to not just open it to the school we open it to the public we are very much thinking about how can we make a safe and protected spaces for everyone how can we how can we deal with the fact that that as as colin said uh, there are high performance facilities and as a small kid you walk in and you're just you're just overwhelmed and this is a big sports hall so we very much try to to uh, to concentrate on how how does the entrance feel how does the the, the dressing room feel so actually we we, we actually reduce the, the sanitary facilities we make them bright and 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 very very open multifunctional we try to to make some chill out zones they even think about uh, making zones in a in a in a uh, competent in a competition hall where where your teams can meet after the game so there's always a winner and a loser but where's actually somewhere where they can meet afterwards can they drink a cup of coffee after after being in a competition so that's what we that's what we're thinking about at the moment we're trying to do this and the last example i showed uh, actually is a sport and fun hall so there is fun in the title and, and actually that's, that's what we really try to do is to make sport and fun in the sports hall. And that's, that is the, the cultural space. We're not so far, but I think we have to go in that direction as Espen said, to put in the cultural uh, uh, place in the middle of, of the sports and to, to put the fun in the middle of, of the sports. But maybe in this aspect, we, we come more to a movement area, but regarding to real sports spaces, we try to be as open, as multifunctional, as, as introspective and accessible as possible. Uh, thank you, Harold. Um, I'm gonna skip one of the questions on my list and ask you to respond quickly to this, this final question before we get to questions from the, uh, the audience. And I think this comes from, in part, our audience will have seen some pretty interesting facilities as part of this presentation. And they probably think, well, that's great for you, but we can't necessarily afford this. So how do you manage the process of balancing municipal budget with innovation and design, access, inclusion, community needs and environmental sustainability? Big question, and I'm gonna ask you to be very, very quick in terms of your response. And I apologize for that. Uh, so let's let's reverse it. Harold, do you wanna take the first shot at this? Oh, thank you very much. So actually, to be quick, we, uh, we don't have an um, opportunity. We have to be low energy. We have to be energy free. So this is actually uh, something that we cannot avoid, but we can be even more sustainable in the building materials. And, and it's, it's some, something like a myth that this always has to be very, very expensive. It does not have to be expensive. Uh, it has to be well thought. And, and I think energy design is something that that does not uh, it costs a little bit more at the beginning. But if you if you're a clever calculator, if you're a good architect, you can really uh, transmit that that in the end these facilities are much on a much better economical level than than a classical one. So there's actually no no big question with with our communities. Uh, but to be honest, the last example I showed nobody asked us to make a PV power plant on the roof. Nobody asked us to use the energy of the power plant and the ice machine, we just did it. And now they're very happy about it. 
Thank you. Um, uh, Colleen, um, I'll ask you next. And if you could keep your comments to just a minute. Sorry to say that to you. Very, very quick. I think it's the golden triangle, which is budget, you know, quality, quantity, and cost. And if you look at the three, um, they are forever linked uh, when you're trying to execute a building. And so we really focus on what are the priorities in consensus building. And it's much easier to do that earlier in the design than to run into budget challenges you know, later in the process. So we really focus on priorities and building consensus around those um, in order to, to feel as though everyone's voice is heard and they have, they have a, a, a say and, 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 and a footprint in what the future could look like. Thank you, Colleen. And Espen, you can close us off on this one. Yes, a uh, hard question again, Conrad, but, uh, but still it's uh, uh, never copy paste. Standardized uh, solution are nearly always wrong. So you have to take the experience from another solution, specialize it for the local priorities, be very hard in prioritizing. So you use the money for what is exactly what they need most. And then uh, uh, very, use extra money in the planning process and you spare the money in uh, building wrong. It's, it's easy to say, but when we have success, that's basically the solution. Thank you, Espen. Now uh, I'm gonna pass the, uh, the mic over to Narita and she can give us um, some, some questions from the floor. Thank you. Conrad, and thank you to all the panels for those wonderful insights. So we've had a, quite a few questions coming in from our viewers, and uh, one of the most liked questions so far, are there innovative ideas that have not yet been incorporated into new facilities, missed opportunities, ideas that you believe need to be considered? So Colleen, start us off. Okay, so um, I think um, in terms of not getting incorporated into facilities, and I think Harold alluded to this before, is being much more intentional about the spaces in between, which is the glue, the social spaces that really hold the building together. And they're the essence of what makes it part of the culture of a community where you're gathering together. And it seems that during the design process, we have a tendency to focus on the pool or the sports hall or the gym or the locker rooms, and we start to pinch what happens in between. And that's somewhat where the magic is. And so I think I always uh, try to think very um, you know, diligently about how that can unify a building. Um, and, um, and sometimes, you know, that's one of those things that I feel like sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't happen because the demand for the size of the pool can outweigh because it's subjective versus objective and the subjectivity of a gathering space that keeps getting smaller and smaller um, versus a pool, you can't touch it. It is the, the length that has to be or a sports hall. Um, and so the size of the gym doesn't change, but those spaces can sometimes get, get cut out. So I would advise giving, giving them the due attention that they deserve. Harold. Sorry, thank you very much. So I think uh, um, uh, following up that question, uh, a very important thing will be to, to stack facilities, to, to go into the vertical organization. So we, we, we now did a design in Hamburg and, and we didn't realize how innovative we are, but we stacked the, the dressing rooms and they said, wow, uh, now we have a bigger sports hall and we have much, much more movement area and it was so simple to do it. But the, 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 the ground was so, so small that we had to do this. And very often you forget that with, with some vertical organization and, and, uh, and this is actually, I think the future to organize vertically to, to intensify. And, and I think these are changes that have to be done very, very early to, to program the facility and to see how the space can be used as, as well as possible. Thank you. And I'll just offer a comment there. This, this notion of stacking in a really significant way is something that uh, we certainly have seen um, in the United States to a degree in Canada. Colleen, I'm thinking about um, the, the gym at Boston U and the, the, the stacking there, and you've got others. 
Um, and I, I've also seen it in some European um, situations. So it's, it, and uh, Katie Barnes of uh, Denver, they're doing that kind of same approach. Uh, but back to, back to the question. Uh, and uh, Esben, you'll close us off on this one. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, the the in-betweens are very interesting. And I showed you a picture here from a, a professional gym hall. This is not a playground. It's a gym hall where you work with uh, sections within the same space. So you can have different kind of training on top of each other. That's extremely interesting. Having the space being the third trainer. So you have the trainer but you also have the space as the trainer. I think there we can work much more on different kinds of sports and how to look into that. A football field is not a football field. It's interesting which kind of actions you want to do in your training. Can you build the area around to fit the training? Thank you. And Narita, um, next question. Yes, I think we have time for one more question. I think so, yeah. So if you can expand on how these innovative spaces are funded and how operating costs are managed for facilities. So I think coming from the city perspective, a lot of us have um, issues with balancing municipal budget with innovative ideas and environmentally sustainable practices. And uh, I'm wanting to get your take on um, how you feel if you had to ever sacrifice anything. Expand on that, please. So let, let, because um, Esben, you're from the municipal side, let's, uh, let's start with you on that one. Um, it's a huge political debate uh, and, we, and we are behind. For example, last week, our uh, government of the whole of Denmark just decided that giving extra space uh, for using money for facilities in all the bigger cities in Denmark, and that's totally new. So it's, it's mainly public funded. Uh, in Denmark, but we have a special system where huge uh, companies can make a foundation so they can get uh, pay less tax if they support good purposes. And uh, that's uh, really often a third of the cost of building new uh, sport facilities in Denmark. We have like Carlsberg or uh, Novo Nordisk, you may know some of these uh, huge international companies. They are placed in Denmark and some of their surplus are used for these uh, purposes. And that, that's a key thing because it's a lot of extra money besides the public funding. Pauline, I know that um, from your background in university facilities, there's an alumni source there that is probably more generous than any other country in the world. Is that important to you? And, and um, can you answer the question from a municipal side as well? Yeah, I think um, our, in our collegiate side, um, there is a tremendous amount of investment in facilities. And some of those uh, facilities are then opened up to the community, uh, community memberships. Um, and, and so on the, but on the public side, it's very much funded um, by the actual communities themselves. Um, the, the, it's, a, it's a different model in terms of uh, the financial um, contributions, I would say, from the government. But I think where we sometimes flip that focus is on the revenue generation side. Because if the pro forma can generate um, more revenue, that allows you to then have more opportunities. So we seem to be so focused on what that pro forma looks like. And um, how it meets the community needs and how it can generate revenue to offset the operating costs so that you can get as close to break even as possible because that facilities are often not endowed. And so the communities have to fund the operating costs as well as the initial capital costs. So if there's anything that we can do in the way that we make isolate a gym or isolate a pool that can be rented on the weekends or anything to, to generate revenue, that all goes to the bottom line and helps um, um, offset the ask um, and offset the um, endowment of the ongoing um, operational costs. But it's a very different um, structure. And I'm certainly jealous because some of the amazing facility, leisure facilities, um, you know, we just don't necessarily have them to the degree that uh, we certainly see across the pond and, and even in, in, in Canada as well, certainly. Sure. 
So, so Harold, uh, closing with you, what is the, um, the Austrian response to that? Well, actually, the Austrian response is that most of our facilities are, are done by, by public money. So it's always uh, public money that uh, there is very little investment by, by clubs. Uh, it's starting at, at the moment. Very, very often, especially in Vienna, uh, clubs have the chance to get uh, place and spaces for very cheap money, and they can try to invest some own money or some money by by some some investors so this is starting at the moment uh, and it's still too weak and i think also regarding the the, the costs for the running costs we're not we're not yet as as conscious about about these costs so we still don't think too much about about the running costs that results in that we close the facilities too early in the evening so what we have to do and what we are doing is uh, try to open the facilities that we already have uh, two hours long in the evening uh, open them up to make them more more feasibility and to rethink also maybe the cost structure of of, of the people using the facilities at the moment, we're still on the thank, you, thank you, Harold. And I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Colleen Espen and Danielson for participating. For me, it was a real pleasure in terms of uh, moderating this discussion. And uh, Narita, I will pass it on to you because I think we're out of time and ready to close. All right. Thank you, Conrad. And thank you to all of our panelists. So this does conclude part two out of four of the Recreation Facility Innovation Lecture Series. I want to thank again our three panelists, Colleen, Esben, and Harold, for taking the time to discuss with us today. And also, I'd like to thank our ASL interpreters, our IT support, Dennis and Liz from HDR, and the major recreation and culturals team, Tina and Conrad. So the next lecture will be taking place on Wednesday, June 16th from 8 to 9 a.m. and that is Vancouver time. Here we'll be, be, we will be discussing ice arena facilities and our panelists for next week will be James McLaughlin. He is acting director of recreation at the city of Calgary. Jim Cavillage, partner at Opsis Architecture and Victor Jonkins, partner at MJMA Architects located in Toronto. I'm sorry if we were unable to get to your question today on Slido. Uh, we are very limited to time, but again, thank you so much for uh, supporting this series and watching and uh, to our viewers, this will be posted on the city website. Um, the one from last week has not been posted yet as is currently being edited, but it will be posted this week along with this one. So thank you again for watching and we hope to see you at the next lecture. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>